Well, good morning. Happy Sabbath. How blessed we all are to be together this morning and to be, and for the reason that we're here. We're all here because Jesus Christ is Lord. And he's the Lord of our lives. And he's worthy to be praised. Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we break the bread of life this morning. Father in heaven, we do so thank you for the gift of your Son, our precious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for the blessed and holy Sabbath day. We thank you for every good and perfect gift. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of your word that you've given us to learn by, to grow by, to study, to get into, to learn how we can better serve you and how we should direct our lives. We ask you, Lord, to open your word to us this morning. Open our hearts that we can receive all that you would have for us this day. To the end that we may serve you a whole lot better than we do. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I brought this old Bible with me this morning. It's got some mileage on it, but so do I. You know, I just celebrated my birthday yesterday, and this was printed the same year that I was born. And it bears the name James also, so I figured I'd bring it along with me and use it. Uh, It's just an old King James Bible, but, you know, God was good uh, in giving us his word in giving us uh, the source of comfort and correction and learning and understanding so we can grow to come to know him. The um, title of the sermon this morning, Jesus is Looking, uh, is not just, uh, it's not like a big brother Thing, you know, Jesus is watching, big brother is watching. Although I don't know about you, but I'm glad that I have a big brother named Jesus. And I'm glad that he watches over me every single step of the way. He is my deliverer. He is my strength. He is my hope. He is the one that lifts me up when I'm down. He's the one who's with me when tragedy strikes, when things go wrong. He celebrates my accomplishments and my joys with me. And he's the one who's one day returning to bring me to my heavenly home. And as well as all of those who have placed their hope and their faith and their trust in him. But he asks some things of us, doesn't he? In the scriptures that were read this morning, I'm looking at Revelation chapter 12. And... Verse 11, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And I hear that verse of scripture read a lot. I hear people using it a lot and quoting it a lot. But I also hear a lot of times where the tail end of that scripture is left off. And they loved not their lives unto the death. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony and they loved not their lives unto the death. Jesus is looking for those who will not love their lives unto the death. Jesus is looking for those who will lay down their lives at his feet. Those who will walk with him. Those who will stand up and be counted no matter what. And we're going to see that more and more in these last days. It's going to be important that people can stand up for Jesus Christ. He wasn't afraid to stand for you and I. He took a stand and he died for you and I that we might be set free from the guilt of our sins and that we might be restored to that place where man had fallen from with God. He was not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters, not ashamed to call us friends. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And, you know, I was reading uh, where there was war in heaven. 
And Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and they prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And Satan sought to see to it that your place and my place might not be found anymore with God. But Satan's place was found, no, not anymore in heaven. It will not be found anymore in heaven. But your place and my place can be found in heaven with God. We can be found to be part of the family of God. We can be found to, to be with God. But we have to pass through some things upon this earth. There are things that are going to come in the last days. And we know that we're living in the last days right now. And you know... There's a lot going on, but verse 17 says, And the dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. You know, I often have people say, well, show me where the Bible mentions uh, Seventh-day Adventists. You know, they are still people... Some ask me, some haven't, but they're, but they're shocked at, why did you go and join that church, you know? Why did you go and become one of them? You used to be one of us. Why did you go and become one of them? Like it's such a big, uh, well, it is a big deal to a lot of people, but why did you do that? Well, because I found out that I want to be part of the people that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ because those are the people who the Bible identifies as God's church, as God's church in the last days. But you know, God has always had a commandment keeping people upon this earth. He's always had a people from Adam and Eve. He's always had a people that have looked for the coming of the Messiah, that have looked for the coming of the Deliverer and have kept the commandments of God. And that's the group of people that I wanted to be a part of. And I was going along, and when I found out that I wasn't, that there were some things I was doing right, but that there were some things that I could do to further please my God and, 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 and walk with my God, not because I wanted to serve him because I was afraid of hell. No, I want to serve him because Jesus Christ came and died upon the cross for me and shed his blood and took me as I was. But well, praise God, he loved me way too much to leave me there. He said, I'm taking you as you were, but I'm going to bring you along until you are what you should be. I'm going to raise you up, and I'm going to set your feet upon a solid rock, and I'm going to give you the way to walk, because I want you to be with me in my kingdom forever. He didn't look at me and say, what a mess. Why don't I just leave you there? I'll find somebody easier to work with. I'll find someone who's not as hard-headed as you. I'll find someone who loves me a little better than you do, and I'll work with them. But no, God is able, as they say, to save from the uttermost to the guttermost. God can take any willing person and lift him up and set him in a place or her in a place where they could never imagine themselves being because of his son, Jesus Christ. But we have to understand, too, that this is war. The dragon was enraged. That word wrath means enraged. And the dragon is who? The dragon is Satan. The dragon is the devil. And he is enraged with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. This is war. And we have an enemy that means business. And God's church has got to mean business. <clears throat> now, more than ever, we, God's church has got to be praying, has got to be seeking the face of Jesus Christ, has got to be looking to him for the leadership that we need and to follow him through because these days are going to get rougher and rougher. And it pains me when I see the church and I mean the church as a whole, not just our, not just the Seventh-day Adventist church, but every single person under the sun that names the name of Jesus Christ. And I see the things that are going on. And yes, it's even happening in our church too, where there are these little uh, 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 powder kegs popping up over here. And we divert our attention over there. And we divert our attention over this way. And there are some even within our own church who would take this scripture and they would 
divide it up, and they would twist it and turn it until it's nothing like what God said, until it's nothing like what God had presented it to be to push an agenda, to do something of their own manufacture, to place themselves in a place where they want to be instead of taking the Word of God as it comes and being content to be the commandment keeping people of God. Those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus Christ. Divide and conquer is not a new concept. And that's what Satan wants to do. He's doing it to families. He's doing it to churches. He's doing it to friends. He's doing it to whoever he can get a hold of. And he did it, we know, back in the Garden of Eden. If we go back to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, and verse 1, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all the work which God created and made. That we know that that was, that was, the, that was the beginning of the Sabbath day. That was a creation of the Sabbath day. And I used to, and sometimes people will tell me, well, don't you know that that was for the Jews? That was a Jewish thing for the Old Testament. Well, how many people were on earth when the Sabbath was made? How many people were on earth? How many of those were Jews? None. Jesus said that the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. And I say that because... There was a time when I didn't understand that. There was a time in my life where I did not understand what the Bible really and truly had to say about the Sabbath. And you know, for different people it's different things. But it was learning about the Sabbath that unlocked the door for me. That unlocked what I would call the treasure chest of blessings and knowledge and things that I knew that were in here, but I didn't know how to get them out of here. And I learned how to study. And I learned how to appreciate God's word. And I learned how to apply it in my life because of the instructor right here. You know, I had people tell me, well, you've been brainwashed, you know. Well, I don't know about you, but this is a tough world to live in. And my brain needs a good scrubbing every day. Not just daily, but hourly, momently, the things that we run into. And this is the Brillo pad right here. This is what does it. You see, God's word was put here for a reason. It was put here for our learning, for our understanding, for our knowledge, but not just so we could know, but so we could know how to stand for Jesus Christ. We're going to have to stand and be counted. And we have to know why we believe what we believe. And you know what? For most of us in here, this is all very elementary, things you've heard a thousand times before, but there may be people in here today who don't know this. I don't know everybody in here. I don't know what you know. I don't know what you don't know. But I do know that my Jesus is Lord. And I do know that he's coming back one day for a people that are ready to receive him. He's coming back one day for a church that has made himself ready. A church without blemish, without spot, without wrinkle. And he's coming back for those who have taken their rest in Christ. He's coming back to raise them up. And he's coming back for those who have stood. And we're going to have to stand in these last days. And you know, we know that, that, that God's people fell into sin. We don't know when Adam and Eve sinned. We don't know how long they enjoyed things on the earth for before they ate that forbidden fruit, before they disobeyed God's commandment. But we do know that they did. So we do know that God keep, gave people commandments back in those days. And in Genesis uh, well, in, in Genesis chapter 3, we know that 
man sinned. We know that Adam and Eve sinned. They ate of the tree that God said, do not eat from this tree. Do not touch that tree. Forget that tree. Don't bother with it. But you know, they did. And now something was wrong, wasn't it? Now something existed between God that hadn't existed before. There was a fracture in the relationship. The relationship had been damaged. It had been soured. Now God wasn't sour with them. God loved them. He came and he said, what's wrong? Adam, where are you? What's wrong, my child? What have you done to yourself? But you know, there's also hope given at that same time. We know that the Lord, uh, when he was questioning the serpent, and he was questioning Adam, and he was questioning Eve, and asking them, what did you do? Not that he didn't know, but what did the Lord want? He wanted honesty. He wanted confession. He wanted them to stand, stand up and say, yes, we did this. Yes, we did this. But you know what? He gave hope. He gave hope. Uh, we read about the woman in Revelation. We know that in the Bible, the woman is a symbol for the church. And you know, God is the God of hope. Amen? Amen. How, you, you cannot know God. You cannot walk with Jesus Christ and not be hopeful. If Jesus has taken you by the hand, he's walking through you this life, no, you through this life, no matter what happens, no matter what befalls, no matter what comes our way, we have hope because he's a God of hope and he's a God that gives hope. And what did he tell Eve in, in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15? And I will put enmity, he told Satan, the serpent, between thee and the woman. And between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. There's hope. There's a deliverer coming. I am going to put enmity between you and her, between your seed and her seed. Yes, he's telling Eve, he's telling people, you're going to carry on. You've got a future. It's not all over with. The end is not yet. And I'm going to send the deliverer. I'm going to send a Messiah. And you know, we, we have to understand that even though the Ten Commandments weren't written down yet, they weren't etched in stone yet at this time, the people had the commandments in their heart. God's commandments were written on their heart because in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 3 it says, In the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstling, firstlings of the flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. And I'm not here to go into the difference between Cain's offering and Abel's offering, but why did they bring an offering? in the first place. Whether one was the wrong one and one was the right one, that's not the point for right now. The point is, why did they bring an offering? They brought an offering because they had hope. They brought an offering because they knew that there was a God who they could go to and who they could call on. They brought an offering because they had the hope of tomorrow. They had the hope that one day God is going to deliver. They had the hope of what that offering would do. They had a hope that there was a God. They knew there was a God who would receive the offering. Now, Cain didn't know that God would reject his offering. If he knew that he would have rejected it, he might not have brought it, but he brought it. And God did say, if you come to me in the right way, if you're right, won't I accept you too? I accepted your brother, surely I'll accept you too. But he gave us a hope. He gave his people hope. And that's what we need to have today is hope that no matter what we see going on, and there's a lot going on. There are some tumultuous times. The Bible told us that there would be perilous times, that in the last days things were going to get bad. And we can see things. I mean, there's a lot of hope right now because there's been a big change in all this. But you know what? Things are coming to an end. The great controversy is about to reach its culmination. And we know that before it does, things are going to get mighty rough. Things are going to get very bad for those who will dare to keep the commandments of God 
and have the faith of Jesus Christ. Our faith is going to be called. We're going to be called to compromise. We're going to be forced to compromise. We're going to be put to death if we don't compromise sooner or later. But only those who stand for Jesus Christ will be found to make it through. And, we, and you, know, you, you know what it takes to stand for Christ? It takes the Holy Spirit in us. It takes Jesus Christ alive and well and working within us. It takes his people doing his work. It takes his people bowing to him and praying to him continually. You know, the only way to be strong, the Bible tells us to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. We got to be strong in Christ. We got to be praying as never before. We've got to lay it all down at his feet and say, Lord, whatever it is in my life that's hindering me from walking with you, whatever it is that's going to put a wall up between me and you, take that out of the way. I don't want it anymore. Whatever it is, I'll gladly give it. The problem is we like to hold on to too much for too long. Oh, when I said take it, I didn't mean that. When I said take it, I meant that, but not that. We can't pick and choose anymore because the time is so short. We're talking about stewardship in our Sabbath school lesson this morning and uh, how we can be uh, so good at maybe our tithe, you know, returning tithe and offering. We can be so good as stewards in one area and be so bad in another area. God is an impeccable accountant. And he's going to call us to account for everything he's given us. He's going to call us, he's going to say, what did you do with the time that I gave you to reach out to other people in my name and tell them about me? What are you going to do with, what did you do with the opportunities? What did you do with the gifts? What did you do with your own special, unique thing that I gave you to impact your corner of the world? Your sphere of influence. Lord is going to call each and every one of us to account for what he's given us and what we've done with it. He's given us some marvelous things. Look at all the different gifts and things that were shared just in here today. He's given us gifts of ministry. He's given us gifts of, of, of help. He's given us gifts of music and talent. He's given us every single gift and he's going to say, what did you do with it all? Where is the return on my investment? Jesus Christ is looking. He's looking for souls. He's looking for souls to populate the kingdom of heaven. He's looking for, you know, he, I read the back of the book. I read how he's going to return this earth to its original state of perfection. Its original order. He's going to, again, have a perfect earth. And he's going to, again, place a perfect people upon this perfect earth. And it's going to be you and I if we'll hold on to our faith in Jesus Christ. We've all done our share to mess it up, but then we gave our lives to Christ and he's bringing us along and he's going to take those who used to mess it up and he's going to fix it up and he's going to put us right back on it. I am awestruck when I think that the living God is going to relocate the sinner of the government of the universe to this sinful planet. Well, it's not going to be sinful anymore, though, is it? The center of God's universe, he's going to relocate it, boom, to this rebellious planet. To the only planet in all of his creation that rebelled, boom, the seat of God's government right there. I am awestruck every time I think about that. Why? What an awesome God. What a mighty God. That's the power of love. And the Bible tells us that God hasn't given us the spirit of fear. He's given us the spirit of love and of a sound mind. God has given us these things because he wants us to use these things to affect and to impact this world for Jesus Christ. The end is so soon. I can't tell you when, you can't tell me when, but we can see that it's surely not far off. We can see all the things coming together. There are, there are people on the 
political stage right now, on the religious stage right now, that have the power to bring things together so quickly to make your head spin when you think about it. The time is ripe. The time is here. And the time to stand for Jesus Christ, stand up and be counted, is now. I saw Hacksaw Ridge. I'm in the process of reading the book, The Hero of Hacksaw Ridge. I saw the documentary years ago, and I think of men just like that. I think of men just like David, who spoke a little bit earlier this morning, and think of people who, you know what, no matter what, stood for Jesus Christ and would not compromise. And that's what came through in that documentary. That's what came through in that movie. You know, they didn't, they, didn't, uh, they didn't do their Hollywood thing and, and, and cover over all the truth, the faith of this man and how he loved Jesus Christ and that Jesus Christ was the center of his life came through loud and clear. And it's going to have to come through loud and clear for you and I and for every other person that wants to make heaven their eternal home. We're going to be given that opportunity to stand. And we're going to have to stand tall and stand in the power and the strength that God has given us and remember who we are and where we come from. Going to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. God is light. God's word is light. Your light, your word is a light for my path and a lamp for my feet. So I can see where I'm going. So I can see where I'm going. The Bible tells us that the way is so clear, the way is so straight, that a wayfaring man, although a fool, should not err therein. God gave us a straight and narrow path to walk. God gave the children of Israel a straight and narrow path to walk. He threw up a wall of water on each side. Nobody could touch him. There was a pillar of fire behind him. Nobody could come and touch him. The Lord has made a straight and narrow path. And he's given us his word. He's given us the parameters that are within this word. And he said, if I make it straight and I put a 50-foot wall up on either side, they can't fall off. God has made a walkway, a path, a highway that we should not fall off of. Going to Isaiah chapter 5. I said chapter 5, I meant chapter 35. I love reading about things and speaking about things that give us hope. Jesus Christ gives me hope. Every time I open up God's word, it gives me hope. Every time I see that the Lord has paved the way for another day, it gives me hope. But Isaiah chapter 35 and verse 8 says, And a highway shall be there, and a way that shall be, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those, the wayfaring men, though fools shall not err therein. Jesus said that the way to heaven is straight and narrow. Amen. Amen. Straight and narrow. God cares that he doesn't lose one single soul on that highway. Jesus said that the way to destruction is broad 
And a lot of people are going to be on that road. But the way to life is straight and narrow, and few there will be who find it. Are we going to be among the few who are going to find it? Are we going to be among those who are going to walk that highway of holiness, who are going to walk that path that leads to life? We have to decide right now whether or not we're going to because there are elements and they're going to bring some pressure to bear. Right now, there are, like I said, there are people who, who are in these little side arguments and they want to stand up and they want to do this and they have this agenda to push and that agenda to push instead of God's plan to work. God gave us a plan to work. He did not give us an agenda to push. God gave us a plan to work. He did not give us an agenda to push. And it's Satan's tactic to start a fire here and a fire here and keep some people looking that way and some that way and some that way, every way but the way that we should be looking. Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and do what? Follow me. Anywhere that Jesus doesn't go, we don't need to be going. Any place that he goes is where we, that, that's why I'm where I am today. Because when I first came to Christ, I didn't know anything about the Sabbath. I didn't know anything about how to study the Bible. I hadn't used the Bible. I was raised in a church that didn't use the Bible. We used other materials. And so, but you know, I did have enough of the Holy Spirit working in me that when I prayed, I said, Lord, I said, I don't know where this journey is going to lead me. I'm embarking on it right now, but I'll tell you one thing. I'm going to follow you wherever you go. I'm going to follow you wherever you lead me. And that's how and why I wound up here. The Lord led me a different ways through different churches, different denominations, and I'm looking back and I'm beginning to piece together, okay, well, yeah, you know, I guess it was enough for me to learn this first, and then I went somewhere else and learned something else, and, but you know, it, it's the Lord's way of leading. The Lord has his own way. He knows what he's doing. But I said, I'm going to follow you wherever you go. Whatever path you lay out for me is the path that I'm going to walk, because the way I walked before was nowhere. I, 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 when I came to Christ, when I picked up this Bible and I began to read and I began to realize everything that I was not taught and all the error that I was taught, I, I wasn't going to church anywhere at the time at all. And I didn't know where to go. I said, Lord, you're going to have to lead me. You're going to have to show me. You're going to have to tell me the name because I don't know who to trust or who not to trust. I only know to trust you. And after a while, I began to desire Christian fellowship. I began to have a hunger. You know, Christians used to be the last bunch of people I ever wanted to be around because they never had any fun, you know. They couldn't do this, couldn't do that. And, 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 and it was boring and all. And then it got to be where, Lord, I've got to have some Christian fellowship. I'm going to die if I don't get any Christian fellowship, Lord. I know I've got to be in a church somewhere. That's why we're here. That's why I came here today. I came here today to learn something. See, this is just as much for my benefit as it is for yours. I come here to learn because the church is, the purpose of the church, the church is for the equipping of the saints. The church is where we learn how to get outfitted for battle because we've got to do battle. I've never been in the military. Never been any kind of training, basic or otherwise. But I'm sure that when they train, they train so that they can keep themselves alive out on that battlefield. And I'm sure that, 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 that their commanding officer has them follow everything he says to the letter because that's the only thing that's going to keep them alive when they get out there. We've got to do the same thing with Jesus Christ. He's our general. He's our captain. He's the one who leads us, and we've got to hang on every word he says and be obedient to every word he says because that's the only thing that's going to keep us alive in the battle when we hit the battlefield. That's what's going to keep us intact spiritually. That's what's going to keep our salvation intact. And when it says that God's people are those 
who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus Christ, well, that's who I want to be with. That's who I want to be with. When, when soldiers go into battle, they want to be with people on their right side and their left side who are going to be looking out for each other. They want the guy in front and the guy in back to be looking out for each other. And they're looking out for each other. Jesus Christ looks out for you and I, and he's still looking. He's still looking. And you know what he's looking for? He's looking for each and every one to make it. Not just us, but each and every one who names the name of Jesus Christ. And you know, there's something that we have to be aware of, that we have to understand. I'm going to read this to you. I have it on here. I don't know what Bible version this is from. I just have one snapshot of the one paragraph here. It's not the King James, but I think, I don't know if it could be stated any more perfectly. It's from 2 Timothy chapter 3. You should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times for people shall love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful, proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents, and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. They will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. Stay away from people like that. It doesn't mean not to try to reach the lost for Christ. It doesn't mean not to pull out all the stops and do all we can to, to rescue the perishing. But all of, all of those descriptions... That was talking about professing Christians. Paul was warning Timothy about church folk. He said, stay away from people like that. Because there are those who are unrepentant, who are not willing to repent, who have no intention of repenting, but they'll stand up and call themselves Christians all day long. Because Jesus went to the cross, I can do this, this, and that. Because Jesus went to the cross, I don't have to do this, this, and that. Because Jesus went to the cross, I can do what I want, and it's all good. And there are people who insist on that, who believe on that, and they'll take this Bible and they'll prove it to you in their way of thinking. Paul says, stay away from people like that. We want to be with people who are going to help us in our Christian walk, fellow soldiers who are going to have our back, Amen? So that we can all walk that walk that Jesus has called us to. So we can walk that path, walk that highway, and be welcomed. I don't know about you, but I want to hear, welcome, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I'm going to make you ruler over much. You've, you've walked the walk. I want to be able to say like Paul, I've run the race. Now there's a crown of righteousness waiting for me. I want to get that crown just so I can cast it at the feet of my king. Amen. Say, Lord Jesus, this is yours. This isn't mine. This is yours. Praise God. What a time. I'm waiting for that time. I'm looking for that time. I'm yearning for that time. But at the same time, I also want to be able to be a help to as many people as I can to come to Jesus Christ, don't you? Because that's what it's all about. Not just to keep it all in here, not just to keep it bottled up, but to be able to impact and affect as many people as we can. But you know, they all have to have something to believe in. Could you imagine if Doss had picked up that rifle? If he'd have worked just one Sabbath, if he hadn't have been as resolute and as committed as he was to Jesus Christ, 
Who knows how many lives he has impacted? Who knows? In heaven, he might very well see a bunch of those guys who he served with, who he died and had no idea that because of him they gave their lives to Jesus Christ. God is looking for witnesses who will stand up and share their testimony. Sometimes it's not with our tongue. Sometimes it's by our actions, by what we do do or what we don't do. But it takes the Spirit of God working within us. It takes the power of Christ because Satan is out there. He's he come to steal, kill, and destroy. He means business, and he's going to keep right up until the very end. But that's okay because God is more powerful than Satan. Jesus Christ has put Satan under his feet. He is a defeated foe. He is a defeated foe. I've read the back of the book, but as we've seen throughout history, sometimes, sometimes the biggest threat is a defeated foe. Sometimes there's no army more treacherous and dangerous than a retreating army. They found that out in World War II in Europe where the Germans left all kind of booby traps and surprises and things, and they killed many more in their retreat. Many more people. So we have to realize that he's a defeated foe, but we only defeat him when we put our faith in Jesus Christ and we're found in Christ. He is the one who has vanquished the foe. He is the one who's our shield, who's our protector, and is the reason why we can walk in holiness, and the reason why we can walk in faith. It's not a cakewalk, but it's a faith walk. And Jesus Christ is returning, and he's returning soon. And no matter how dark and gloomy things get, no matter what life looks like, we can be sure that Jesus Christ has not and will not abandon us neither height nor depth nor sickness nor any kind of treachery at all can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Amen. Father in heaven, we want to thank you today for your patience, for the great love you have for us, for sending Jesus Christ, Lord, to pay the price for us and die upon the cross without which there be no reason for us to be gathered here today. We thank you again for your great patience and for how you desire for us all to be in heaven with you. And that's the place where we desire to be. Give us the strength, Lord, and the resolve to carry on and to do more than carry on. To be good soldiers of Jesus Christ, to stand up and be counted to give it all over to you now, Lord, so when the test comes, we're ready to stand the test because souls hang in the balance. We ask you, Lord, to be with us now as we leave this place, but not your presence. In Jesus' name, amen.